Okay guys, so we are about to head into the last uh, topic for the semester, uh, which is going to span a few weeks, um, and ultimately it's going to build to developing our final um, control design strategy, or control design tool. Um, it's called the Nyquist Stability Criterion, and it's a method for doing control design in the frequency domain, which is different from what we've seen in the past. Okay, so everything we're going to do from here until the, the end of the semester is building up towards this final um, control design tool. Uh, in order to get there, we have to do a bit of a review on the frequency response function, which means uh, essentially we have to revisit our Bode plots from a previous course. Um, the frequency response itself can be a bit tricky. And what I'm going to do is basically, uh, I'm going to cut to a different portion of a lecture for a different class, which outlines the basic principles of the frequency response. Um, and once we look at this clip uh, as, as a bit of a review, we'll jump into sort of things that we can do to visualize the frequency response, and then we can look at the Nyquist plots from there. Okay, so the frequency response um, concept tends to be challenging for students because uh, we're stepping away from the time domain and we're jumping into something called the frequency domain. Okay, so you've had a little bit of exposure outside of the time domain when we looked at uh, transfer functions in the S domain. Okay, so the S domain, you kind of had to wrap your head around this idea that the S domain is the complex domain as opposed to the time domain, which is sort of this uh, one-dimensional domain. Um, the frequency response is a completely different domain and it just means that the independent argument or the independent variable is not time but rather the frequency. Okay? I'll explain what that means um, in more detail as we, as we go along but I want to sketch out the main idea of the frequency, uh, the frequency response uh, just right off the bat here. Okay, so we've been, we've been studying systems that have some input and some output. Okay, so P of S, this is just some dynamic system, it's some transfer function uh, that represents some real life system. So it's kind of the same thing we've been doing all semester. Um, now what we have been doing in the past is we've been looking at different types of inputs. Okay, so the inputs that we've been looking at could be, you know, impulsive or they could be constant, you know, like a step input or they could be exponential inputs. They could basically any any input that you want to apply, you could simulate that and look at the corresponding output y. Um, for frequency response, we are only concerned with one input. And it's not the input, uh, I'm sorry, it's not the impulse, it's not the step, um, it's the sine wave. Okay. So for frequency response, we're always looking at an input uh, that has a sinusoidal form, like sine of omega t. Okay, now the fundamental idea, the key concept behind uh, frequency response is that if your system is linear and time invariant, which all transfer functions are, um, if we have a linear time invariant system and you apply a sinusoidal input like sine of omega t, the output is guaranteed to have uh, a sine wave with the same frequency, right? So you input sine of 10t, the output's also going to be sine of 10t. However, the key idea here is that the output is going to be scaled, okay? So it's going to be scaled vertically on the y-axis, and it may or may not be phase shifted by some angle phi. That's the main idea behind frequency response, okay? So you hit a system with the sine wave, you're going to get an output uh, that's a sine wave at the same frequency. Okay? Uh, the, the key here is that this what's called scaling factor is called the magnitude. Right? It's called the magnitude and this phase shift well that's just called the phase. And these two terms it turns out that they are themselves functions of the input frequency that you apply at the sine uh, at the sine wave. Okay, so more specifically, <clears throat> we could write the magnitude as uh, 
really it's a as a function of omega, and that's going to change, right? As, as you apply different inputs, the magnitude and the output is going to change. And the same goes for the phase. So these are both functions of this very same input frequency uh, here at U of t. Often, uh, the magnitude and phase are written in terms of the plant itself. So often, instead of a of omega, we'll write it as the magnitude of p of j omega. Right? These are just different ways of writing the same thing. So magnitude can be written as a of omega, or often it's written as you know magnitude with the vertical bars of p of j omega, which is the frequency response function. And I'll explain that in just a little bit as well. Uh, for the phase, we often write this phase angle phi by the symbol uh, for angle. And we can express it as uh, the angle of p of j omega. Okay, p of j omega, that's a frequency response function, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But the main idea, again, is for any LTI system, okay, you hit it with the sine wave, you are guaranteed to have a sine wave of the same frequency in the output. It's just that the output may be scaled vertically and it may be phase shifted horizontally. Okay, that's that's the primary idea behind the frequency response. Um, to illustrate this idea, uh, what I thought I could do is to basically set up a little demonstration. And this is very you know low tech. This is very low tech, but I think I still like this demo because it brings a physical element to this very conceptual idea of the frequency response. Okay, so so what we have here is the following. Okay, so there's like a flat surface, like a desk or a table. Okay, and on top of that uh, table, there's just a piece of paper, something that can move back and forth. Okay, so I can I can apply a sinusoidal input. to this piece of paper. So I can basically slide the paper back and forth, like so. And on top of that piece of paper, there's a mass. There's an object. Okay? And that object is sort of sitting on the piece of paper, so there's friction between the mass and the piece of paper. So you, know, you can imagine if you apply a very low frequency sinusoid, there's not enough sort of inertia to, to break that coefficient of friction. So the mass will essentially just stick to the piece of paper. Okay. Uh, however, if you start to oscillate the paper underneath that mass more quickly, you might expect that it starts to slide. Okay. So the mass will slide with respect to the piece of paper. And we're going to consider the output of this particular system to be the horizontal displacement of the mass. Okay. So the input is the displacement of the paper. The output is a displacement of the mass. And we could run this demonstration to illustrate this idea of frequency response. Okay, so we're going to take a couple of cases here. For a very, very small frequency or very low frequency of oscillation, um, if the input is sine of omega small t, uh, we know that based on the definition of the frequency response, the output displacement is going to be some scaling factor times the sine of omega small, right? That same frequency of the input, t, plus some phase shift. Okay, so plus some phase shift. Phi, we'll call that phi 1. Okay, so we can actually get this part by running this uh, demonstration um, sort of live here. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll play a, we'll, we'll switch the view here so that you can actually see uh, this setup on my desk here. Okay, so we'll, we'll start this. Um, and what you can see is that for very low frequencies, essentially the mass, or the penny in this case, is just stuck to the piece of paper, right? The paper is oscillating, but the coin is not uh, sliding or moving with respect to the paper itself, okay? Which means that if the input has a magnitude of, say, 1, and the mass is attached to the paper, then the output also has an amplitude of 1. So experimentally, we could determine the magnitude 
uh, for a low frequency to just be a value of 1. Okay, uh, At the same time, because the mass was physically attached to the piece of paper due to forces of friction, they were oscillating in phase with each other, right? Because they were stuck to one another. So there is no phase shift. So, so we actually have zero degrees of uh, phase for this particular system. Now what we can do is we can actually plot, okay? We can actually plot these two data points on um, a set of axes that looks like this. And notice that the uh, independent variable in both of these plots is the frequency. Okay, it's, this is why it's called the frequency response because it's uh, it's all a function of the the input frequency. Okay, so for the first plot, this is going to be that magnitude as a function of omega, which we often refer to as the magnitude of p. These are these are sort of one and the same. And for the second plot, we're going to look at the phase angle, which is often referred to as the phase of p. Okay, so we've got 0, minus 45, minus 90. We'll just set up these axes here. So we'll say 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, maybe 10 will be up here. Okay, okay. and so for a very low frequency like we had over here, okay? so a low frequency here, on the frequency domain, that corresponds to a value very far to the left. Okay, so for a very low frequency, we're somewhere here. And we'll call this omega small. Okay, now experimentally, we went ahead and determined the magnitude and phase at that very low frequency. So we can actually plot um, a data point. One's right here at a magnitude of 1. And one's right here at a phase of zero. Okay, so what we can do is we can basically do the same experiment. We can do the same experiment at at a higher frequency. So omega high, if we increase the frequency of oscillation of the base of this piece of paper, we're still going to get an output of the same form. Okay we're still going to get an output that's some magnitude times the sine of omega high, so this is a high frequency, plus some other phase. Okay. Now these two values, this magnitude and phase for a high frequency, they're going to be different because the magnitude and phase themselves are functions of the frequency, but we can try to determine those experimentally as well. Okay, so let's see what happens as we sort of speed up Okay, we're going to speed up the input frequency. We're going to speed up faster and faster and faster until at some point we get going pretty fast. And, and we'll jump into slow motion right here. That's pretty fancy, right? When we're in this slow motion phase, you can almost see that the mass is almost stationary. Right? It's not moving very much at all. It's moving a little bit, but, but not that much. Okay, so actually what happens is for this particular system at a very high frequency, we're finding that magnitude is starting to approach zero. It's almost, uh, it's almost just stationary, sitting there while the paper sort of slides under that mass, right? I don't know if you caught it from the slow mo. Um, the the slow mo video kind of indicates that, uh, right? Due to the nature of this system, you have basically a piece of paper and an object on top at a high frequency. I'm sort of pushing the paper, uh, and so there's this frictional force on, on the mass, which is sort of pushing it forward. But before this gets a chance to really accelerate in this direction, I'm already sliding the paper back. So this is sort of out of phase motion as I'm going at a very high frequency. Um, and it turns out for this nature of a system, which is essentially a mass damper system, that for very high frequencies we approach uh, 90 degrees uh, out of phase, so negative 90 lag, lagging behind the input, right? So it's kind of like, right? It's kind of like uh, <laughs> I'm pushing the paper, the mass is sliding, and then it's sort of out of phase this way, right? So kind of like that. Um, what this means is we can go ahead and basically put a second data point on our uh, on our axes over here. So for a very high frequency, we've got another uh, another pair 
uh, of data, and a high frequency is going to correspond to somewhere very far to the right on the frequency spectrum. Okay, so this is omega high, high frequency, and what we found is that the magnitude starts to approach zero, so it gets very small. So somewhere down here at say, you know, 0 0.01 relative to the input uh, magnitude. Um, and we also said, okay, so for this part you kind of have to take my word for it now. Uh, we'll determine this analytically later, but um, right now I'm arguing that the phase at a very high frequency for this type of system is roughly negative 90 degrees. Okay. Okay. So I understand this demo is very low tech, uh, but you can kind of imagine, like if we if we look at this sort of slow motion video that I've produced here. Um, as you start to increase that frequency um, through the frequency spectrum, you're going to basically be able to plot many different points along these uh, along these axes, right? And so, if you were to sort of do an analysis at every frequency along the way, you'd find out that essentially, essentially, you start to trace out this shape. Okay, so this is a very typical magnitude profile for this kind of first order system, right? And so the theoretical magnitude for infinitely high frequency would just be basically zero. And what ends up happening for the phase is that we start at zero while the mass is still essentially stuck to the piece of paper due to friction. And as we increase and approach a frequency of infinity, we sort of approach this phase angle of minus 90. Okay, so you can imagine kind of doing this experiment for all frequencies and this is what you would this is what you would trace out. Okay, so so this demo that we just did here, right? This demo um, this demonstration this demonstration basically allowed us to try to visualize the magnitude and the phase as functions of omega, right, which is the input, which is the input frequency. And ultimately, as you produce these two sets of plots that are themselves functions of omega, you get this pair of plots which is called the Bode plot. Okay, so we're going to go into Bode plots, uh, Bode plu. We're going to go into Bode plots in great detail later, but I'm just using this as sort of our very first introduction into the frequency response. Okay, okay so there you have it, a very brief overview and sort of a review of um, the concept of frequency response. So, you know, at this point in this course, this is supposed to be a uh, review, um, but I figure it's always worthwhile to do a uh, you know, very explicit um, a review of exactly, you know, um, what I want you to understand about the frequency response. Okay, so what we looked at in that little clip was uh, essentially you looked at the Bode plot of a first order low pass filter. Um, so you looked at uh, the Bode plot of uh, essentially a transfer function that has the form A over S plus A, so just a first order transfer function. Um, you could do a similar thing for any other system. You could set up a little experiment um, apply a sine wave of different frequencies and record the uh, mag magnitudes and phases for all frequencies and when you plot those out um, across the frequency spectrum you get the corresponding Bode plots. Um, what I've done here is I've put together a list of seven fundamental transfer functions and their Bode plots. Um, these are fundamental in the sense that if you understand um, how all seven of these Bode plots sort of work and what transfer functions are associated with them, that gives you the ability to sketch the Bode plot for any arbitrary transfer function. Okay, so that's sort of the end goal of this portion of the review is I want you to be able to sketch the Bode plot for any transfer function that I give you. Okay, um, and the way to get there is to understand um, First of all, that there are these sort of building block transfer functions, these seven that I've given you here. Um, and second of all, the sort of logical uh, progression or the, the process for which you would uh, sketch up um, a Bode plot for a very complex transfer function. Okay, So if you look here, <coughs> this uh, 
the sheet that I'm going to make available to you, it's got the the two first order transfer functions, which are just inverses of each other. So P1, this is the form of a, a first order low pass filter. This is what you saw in that first demonstration in the clip that you just watched. Um, so this transfer function A over S plus A is always going to have a Bode plot that looks like this. The only difference being that the cutoff frequency, which is the point at which the magnitude starts to roll off, that is going to be different for each transfer function of this form. Okay, uh, Notice that the phase starts at 0, ends at negative 90. It passes through minus 45 at the cutoff frequency um, specified in the transfer function. P2 is just the inverse of that, right? It's S over A, uh, S plus A over A. So you just get an inverse in the Bode plot. Um, these are your two first order transfer functions. Uh, this sheet, this handout, has a pair of second order um, transfer functions as well of the form uh, in terms of omega n, the undamped natural frequency, and zeta, the damping ratio. Um, the thing that's unique, uh, there's a couple of things that are unique about second order uh, systems. The slope of the roll off, right, so after the cutoff frequency, the slope of this line here for second order systems is minus two decades per decade. In other words, for every decade you cross in the frequency domain, you're decreasing by one, two decades. So the slope of minus two here. Uh, this is in contrast to a first order system, which has a slope of minus one decade per decade. So that's what's unique to second order systems. Second order systems also have this interesting feature where the magnitude can actually grow before it, it starts to attenuate. Um, this is a feature uh, only in second order systems and higher order systems, and it's called resonance. Okay, So um, you've all seen the video of <clears throat> the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in uh, Washington, where the wind sort of gets the bridge uh, oscillating, and it oscillates at such a frequency that the magnitude is actually larger then the structure can support, and eventually the bridge uh, crumbles. Um, this is sort of your your go-to example for uh, a resonance, and that's basically the system is being excited at a frequency such that the amplitude is larger than one, right? So you get uh, you get magnification or amplification in the output, as opposed to attenuation where the magnitude is less than one. Okay, so that's the second notable thing for um, second order systems. Uh, the final thing is that um, first order systems, the phase diagram starts at 0, ends at minus 90, passing through minus 45 at the cutoff frequency. For second order systems, phase starts at 0, ends at minus 180. So it ends up at 180 degrees out of phase, passing through minus 90 at the cutoff frequency. Okay. Um, there's a couple of notes here about the second order systems. Um, a second order system does not always have a resonant peak. Sometimes it looks very similar to a first order system where there's no resonant peak uh, and it just rolls off with a slope of minus two decades per decade. Uh, anytime you have second order dynamics, it's your job to check to see if resonance exists. Um, and so a resonant peak exists for zeta is less than root two over two. Uh, remember, zeta is the damping ratio, which is just a normalizing um, factor that sort of uh, uh, characterizes the effective damping in the system. So as zeta approaches zero, you're approaching the undamped case, which means there's almost no damping. Um, in that scenario, in that scenario, you're you're certain to have a, a resonant peak, um, and it turns out the magnitude of the resonant peak grows as um, as omega, uh, I'm sorry, as zeta approaches zero. Okay, so something to know anytime you have second order dynamics, whether it's in this form, P3 or P4, which is the inverse. Okay, so for P3, you would have to check to see if a resonant peak exists by computing zeta. And in P4, you actually have to check to see if there's an anti resonant peak. Um, in P4, an anti resonant peak exists when zeta is less than. Um, root 2 over 2. So the criteria is the same, but for P3 you're seeing if a resonant peak exists, for P4 you're seeing if an anti-resonant peak exists. Okay.
Um, these are the four sort of really fundamental transfer functions. And then there's an additional three sort of special transfer functions. Uh, one is the case where you have purely inertial dynamics, so 1 over s. Um, there's another transfer function that's uh, just equal to s. And then there's a final transfer function, which is just for a constant value. Okay, So between all seven of these transfer functions um, and their corresponding Bode plots, um, you can actually construct the Bode plot for any arbitrary transfer function that I can give you. Okay, uh, What we're going to do now is take a look at exactly how to do that um, so that we can look at some examples of, of basically how to construct uh, Bode plots for very complex transfer functions. Okay, so the first thing to recognize is that um, the, the seven fundamental transfer functions that I just gave you, uh, those are fundamental because, um, in general, for any transfer function that I give you, you could break down, you could break that transfer function down into essentially a product of a bunch of smaller or simpler transfer functions that would fall somewhere on that um, set of seven fundamental transfer functions. Okay, so so basically any one of any transfer function can be written as some combination of those seven fundamental transfer functions. And you would get that just by factoring out um, what you can and splitting, you know, you know, if, if P of S is some eighth order transfer function, you might split it down into, uh, you know, four uh, second order transfer functions, a product of four second order transfer functions, uh, for example. Okay, so, so that's the first thing to recognize. Um, that's the reason that I gave you those seven, is because any transfer function can be written as a product of those seven fundamental transfer functions. Um, then the frequency response function you get by plugging in j omega everywhere you see s in the transfer function. Okay, so this would look more like p of j omega, which is the frequency response function. Right, That's actually what we want. That could be written as just a product of a bunch of those seven fundamental transfer functions in the frequency domain. And then the idea is that each one of each one of these simpler transfer functions, uh, we'll just call it p sub i. So for any, basically, any of these simpler transfer functions can be expressed uh, in exponential form. Right, so it, i just represents the subscript a, b, c, d, however many of these are. Any of these simpler transfer functions can be expressed in exponential form, which means basically r e to the j uh, phi, like so. Remember that complex valued functions can be expressed in a number of different ways, and exponential form just happens to be one of those ways. Right? So this is now a complex valued function expressed in exponential form. Then, then it turns out that this original big transfer function that can actually be expressed in exponential form as well in this way. Okay, so it can also be expressed in exponential form where r bar here that's equal to the product of all of these individual uh, all of these individual uh, magnitudes. Okay, so this would be like R A, R B, R C, and so forth. It's a product of all of them. And it turns out that this phase, that can be expressed as the sum of all of these individual phases. Okay, so this is a product. The magnitudes are a product. And the phases are a sum. Like so, okay. Uh, this, the fact that the phases are a sum, that's actually very convenient. 
right? What we're trying to do ultimately is build up a procedure for sketching the Bode plot for a very complex, uh, complex or complicated transfer function. Um, and if we know that for the individual transfer functions, if the phase is the sum of all of those individual transfer functions, then that means on the Bode plot itself, that implies that we can just superimpose uh, the phase diagrams for several transfer functions to get the total phase diagram uh, for the for the overall transfer function here. Right, so this is this is actually a good thing that the phases are a summation. The problem here is that the same thing doesn't apply to the magnitudes of all of the individual transfer functions. Right, we have a product here, r times a times uh, I'm sorry, r a times r b times r c. That does not lend itself to graphical superposition, which is inconvenient. Okay, so the way around this, the way around this is well, what what if we were to take the log of this overall, you know, uh, r r bar product, um, and take the log of both sides of this equation essentially. So take the log of this would be r a r b this basically this entire product, take the log of that product. Um, then by one of the properties of log, uh, we have that this is equivalent to the sum. Uh, why am I using bars here? I, I just meant to use parentheses here, right? Take the log of, of these things. Okay, so take the log of r. Uh, so one of the properties of the logarithm is that the log of a product of several things becomes the sum of their individual logs. Okay, so this becomes log of R A plus log R B plus log R C and so forth. Right? So what we're finding is that we if we take the log of the magnitude, then the corresponding uh, individual magnitudes become the sum of their logs. So this is a very nice feature as well. It's the same um, as with the phases, except now we have to take the log of each of the magnitudes. Okay. Um, the reason the reason I'm I'm going through this little exercise here is to motivate why the Bode plots generally have the axes that they do. Okay. Uh, the Bode plots that we're used to seeing, the Bode plots that we're used to seeing have a magnitude plot on a log log scale right so the frequency is always on a log scale because this makes it easier to visualize so like 0.1 1 10 uh, but the magnitude plot is always seen on a log scale right so you'd have like 10 to the 0 10 to the minus 1 10 to the minus 2 right so this is a typical scale that you would see for a Bode plot and for the phase the frequency is log, but the the uh, the vertical axis is generally linear. So zero degrees, minus forty five degrees, minus ninety degrees, and so forth. Right. Well, this is the reason right here because it's very convenient to superimpose the log of several individual transfer functions in the same way that we can superimpose the uh, the phases. Um, on, on a different set of axes, okay? So the fact that the sum of the logs of the magnitude make up the total magnitude of the, of the, of the transfer function, and the sum of the phases themselves give you the total phase, all of that leads to the fact that we can actually do graphical superposition of a product of several of these fundamental transfer functions. <coughs> okay, so let's see how this works with an example. Okay, so let's suppose I wanted you to sketch the Bode plot. All right, I want you to sketch the frequency response by hand of a transfer function that looks like this. All right, s plus 1 over s plus 10. Uh, now this, you know, doesn't look like any of those seven fundamental transfer functions that I gave you, but like I said, mathematically speaking, any transfer function that exists uh, 
mathematically can be factored down into a product of one or more of those seven fundamental transfer functions. So we can see here, we can write this as one-tenth times s plus one over one times s, I'm sorry, times 10 over s plus 10. Okay, so you can see immediately that I was able to factor this original transfer function down into three simpler transfer functions. And all three of these, all three of these guys, uh, exist on, on um, the, the chart of seven fundamental transfer functions. Okay, so we'll call, we'll call this P, I don't know, we'll call this PA, call this PB, we'll call this PC. Now the idea here is just like we saw before, just like up here, once you once you factor your initial transfer function down into a product of several of those fundamental transfer functions, then it turns out the total Bode plot, uh, the total Bode magnitude for the original function, we can get by summing the logarithm of each of the individual uh, uh, transfer functions, and the total phase we can get by summing the actual phases for those individual. Uh, transfer functions. Okay, so let's see what this is going to look like. We'll deal with the magnitude first. So we'll do the magnitude first, uh, uh, which is okay, which is basically we'll set up the axes like this one, ten. So our omega, uh, our frequency axis is always on a log scale. The magnitude, um, we're going to set up also on a log scale, simply because it makes this superposition easy to do in a graphical sense. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So let's sketch the Bode plot for each of these individual transfer functions on this plot, and then we'll just graphically superimpose them. Right. That's that's why we set up the axis this way, so that we can do that. Okay, the, um, the let's start with B first, actually. Start with the middle one first, because this is one of those seven fundamental transfer functions. Uh, I believe it's transfer function number two. Um, and this is the first order with the uh, polynomial in the numerator. Uh, the way this works is that you basically start with a magnitude of one, Okay, and then you just sort of march along the magnitude of 1 until you hit this frequency, this cutoff frequency, which in this case is 1. And then because it's first order, you start to, you start to go upward, slope upward, with a slope of positive 1 decade per decade. Okay, so this would be the magnitude for P, B. All right, so we're just going to treat this asymptotically first, right? So basically that just means... You basically just identify where that cutoff frequency is, and then head up or down with the proper slope. Okay, uh, so we'll set up the asymptote for PB, for PC, for PC. What we have is um, basically this is the first um, transfer function on that on that fundamental sheet. So we're we're going to start with a magnitude of one to sort of march along this value of 1 until we hit the cutoff frequency of 10 in this case. And in this case, we're going to attenuate at a slope. Oops, missed the mark there. We're going to attenuate with a slope of minus 1 decade per decade, like so. And this is going to be the magnitude of P sub C with a slope of minus 1 decade per decade. Now, if you look at the... Um, the last, I think it's the seventh fundamental transfer function, P7, that's for a constant value. Okay, so for a constant value, that's what we have for PA. And PA doesn't really have anything special to it. There's no cutoff frequency or anything like that. Um, for, for, for a constant value, what you basically have is a horizontal line at that value. So 1 tenth, that's 0.1 or 10 to the minus 1. We're just going to have a Bode magnitude that looks like this, like so.
Uh, that didn't turn out that well. Okay, so we have all three individual um, asymptotic approximations for the individual Bode plots plotted now. Um, all that's left to do is to superimpose all of these graphically. Again, this is the whole reason that we set this up on a log-log scale, is that so we can is so we can do that. Okay, so you kind of just have to go, you know, pick pick your take your pick of of which you want to combine first, right? I I prefer to um, handle all of these sort of interesting stuff like PB and PC, and then deal with the constant values later. Okay, so let's let's combine PB and PC together. Um, the way to superimpose the blue line and the red line graphically is remember it's there's two ways to think about it. You can think of it as a product because that's fundamentally what it is, right? It's a product of the magnitudes. We're just plotting it on the log scale. Or you can superimpose by slope. Okay, so a slope of zero plus a slope of zero makes another slope of zero. So combining the red and the blue asymptote, we just get basically tracking along the same um, horizontal line at 10 to the 0 or 1. Uh, if you think about it as a product, this is just 1 times 1, which equals 1. Okay, uh, Between frequencies 1 and 10, we have a slope of 1 due to PB added to a slope of 0 from PC. So that's again just a slope of 1. Um, so we're going to track along the P sub B uh, asymptote. If you think about it as a product, it's just P sub B times 1, right? Because uh, the horizontal blue line is just at a value of 1. Okay. For frequencies larger than 10, we have a slope of 1 added to a slope of minus 1. In other words, we're going to cancel out. So we're going to have a slope of 0, like so. Now this green asymptotic approximation, this represents the pr uh, the magnitude of the product PB times PC. Okay, so that's two out of the three done. What we have to do now is combine the green asymptote with the orange asymptote to get us our total Bode magnitude plot. The way that works is again, if you treat it as a product, right, then the entire green line we're just multiplying by a value of. 0.1 or 10 to the minus 1. What that means is the entire green line just gets shifted down by that amount. Okay, so to combine the green asymptote with the orange, fundamentally we're just going to end up with uh, this asymptote here, which is has the same shape as the green one above, but it's just shifted down by uh, one decade. And this purple plot now becomes the asymptotic approximation for the overall Bode magnitude plot. And you just have to remember now that Bode plots don't have sharp corners like this. Okay, So all you have to do is, is, is now sort of recognize that, okay, we're going to traverse along all these frequencies at horizontally, but at this cutoff frequency here, at 1, this was due to the cutoff frequency of PB. And PB is first order, so you don't have to worry about any anti-resonant peaks or resonant peaks here. You're just going to get a nice smooth transition along these asymptotes. Okay, and then that's going to continue on until we hit this sort of cutoff here. The reason that the slope goes from 1 back to 0 at a frequency of 10 is because of this cutoff frequency on P sub C. Okay, which again is first order, so you don't have to worry about any uh, resonant peaks. So again, we're just going to get this nice smooth transition, and you could finally sketch in your total your total Bode magnitude plot for p. Okay, that's what it's going to look like. This pink this pink line. It's important to note everywhere where there's a slope. Uh, it's important to note what that slope would be as well. Okay, so this is an example of superimposing several more basic transfer functions to get the total Bode plot for the original transfer function s plus 1 over s plus 10. Uh, the phase plot, the phase plot's actually more straightforward. Okay, so the phase plot, the phase plot's going to work by 
um, pure graphical superposition. Okay, so there's no, we don't have to add asymptotic approximations by slope or by the product. Um, because the, the math behind the phase was a pure summation, then the phase plot is actually more straightforward. Okay, so remember that the phase plot is going to be on a semi-log plot where the frequency axis is on a log scale, but the, the phase axis is just on a linear scale. Um, and for the phase, actually, if you look at the transfer function associated with the constant value, there is no phase contribution. It's just a, a line, there's zero phase contribution throughout the frequency spectrum. Okay, so what that means is our total phase plot becomes a superposition of just two Bode phase plots for these two, uh, PB and PC. Um, for P sub B, we have its first order, the uh, polynomials in the numerator, so we're going to start at 0 and end up at positive 90, and we're going to pass through 45 degrees at this cutoff frequency of 1. Okay, so it'll look something like this. Okay, so this is going to be the Bode phase plot for P sub B. Uh, we'll do phase of PB. And then for PC, you just have to consult your tra uh, transfer function sheet, your fundamental transfer function sheet, and you'd find that it's going to start at 0 and at minus 90, it's going to pass through minus 45 at this cutoff frequency at a uh, frequency of 10. So this Bode plot, Bode phase plot, will look something like this. And this is for P sub C. And then the rest is simply superimposing these graphically, right? So you don't have to add by, you know, I mean, you don't have to superimpose by the product or the slope. You just add these two plots together because they're on a linear scale. Okay, so anywhere both phases are zero, you know, you're going to have zero phase. Um, the blue line is zero up until about this point, according to the way that I've drawn it. So zero phase added to this red plot means that we're just going to follow along the red plot. Right, like so. However, at some point, right around, right around here, we start to get some negative phase due to the um, uh, Bode plot from P sub C. And actually, what you can see way out at really high frequencies, you've got 90 degrees plus a negative 90 degrees. So eventually, the total Bode phase plot is going to return back to zero for the remainder of all, all the higher frequencies. Okay, so between this frequency and sort of this area here, we're basically taking the red plot but subtracting this amount from it, right? So for example, for this frequency here, we're going to have this minus this, which puts us, I don't know, somewhere about here. Okay, so if you do that for all these frequencies, you find that we start to divert away from the red plot according to subtracting this amount of phase and we will eventually reach back at zero degrees, like so. And this becomes our overall Bode phase plot, um, which is this pink line here. Uh, for, for this reason, actually, this form, in fact, we've seen a controller like this in a previous um, a lecture or, or lab or something like that. Uh, this is called a lead controller. Uh, precisely because of this right here, right? This form of a transfer function introduces phase lead into the system, right? So all the uh, phases are either zero or greater than zero. Uh, whereas if you flipped it, if you had s plus 10 over s plus 1, you'd have a lag controller. So you this hump would be in the negative, right? So that's just the two, that's the reason these are called uh, lead lag control. That's just sort of a fun fact for you, okay? Um, hopefully what this example has illustrated is how you can essentially take um, any any transfer function and break it up into a product of, of one or more of those seven fundamental transfer functions, uh, essentially sketch 
each of those individual Bode plots and then superimpose them graphically to give you the total uh, Bode plot. And that's, that's what we were after here. There is an example in the notes, um, which I would consider sort of a benchmark example. Um, I'm not going to do it here on this lecture, um, but the idea here is if you can sketch the Bode plot for this transfer function using the method that we just applied uh, to the example above, uh, then, you, then you're in really good shape. Okay. If you can do this, if you can sketch this Bode plot by hand, um, then you've got everything that I'm expecting you to understand. And the idea is, in order to sketch this Bode plot, there's nothing special about it. You just have to break this down into, again, a product of those seven fundamental transfer functions, sketch the individual Bode plots of those transfer functions, and then superimpose those. Okay? So it's a, a little bit longer, right? especially for these second-order transfer functions, you have to check for resonance or anti-resonance. And if, if each of these has a resonant or anti-resonant peak, that's going to appear in the Bode plot at that frequency. Um, but other than that, the entire process is exactly the same thing that we did uh, in this example above. Okay, so give that a try. Um, if you have issues with that, we can talk about this in the discussion. However, um, there's a brief explanation of how to do this in the notes, so I'll give you a chance to review that, and if you have any questions, we can talk about it then. Okay, so this is supposed to really just be a review of things you picked up in System Dynamics uh, 3401, um, but I always figure it's a good idea to sort of refresh your memory um, and sort of highlight the things that I think are important to, to understand about the frequency response. Um, remember the Bode plots, there's two of them, Bode plots are uh, a visualization of the frequency response function and they are plotted against frequency, right? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, we're building towards um, this, this final uh, control design tool called the Nyquist Stability Criterion. Um, one of the things we need to complete the control design using that criterion is something called the Nyquist plot. Um, now, hopefully this will all become clear why we're reviewing Bode plots in such detail. But the Nyquist plot is nothing more than a visualization of the Bode plot, but in the S-plane, right? So in the S-plane, we've got, um, you, you've got your real and imaginary axes. Um, on a Bode plot, you have two separate plots, both plotted against frequency. Um, Again, the Nyquist plot is exactly the same information that a Bode plot gives you. It's just that you visualize it in the S-plane. Um, as it turns out, the Nyquist plot is uh, a key uh, piece, a, a critical piece of information we need in order to use the Nyquist stability criterion. Okay, so that's why we're building up sort of incrementally, reviewing frequency response. Now we're going to learn about something new called the Nyquist plot. But hopefully with this review of frequency response, you can see how things will translate uh, a little bit more clearly over to the S-plane. Okay, so, so over, the next, uh, over the next lecture and a half or so, um, I'm going to give you two different methods to sketch the Nyquist plot. Uh, the first method is, uh, in my opinion, the more intuitive method. Um, because you're literally transferring information from the Bode plot onto the S-plane. Okay, so, so method one requires uh, use the Bode plot and you're going to basically produce a Nyquist plot for frequencies from uh, zero all the way up to positive infinity because that's what a Bode plot tells you, right? It tells you the frequency axis goes from zero up to positive infinity. Um, one of the interesting features about a Nyquist plot, however, is that it accounts for all values, all, all numeric values from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so it's strange to think about negative frequencies, but the Nyquist plot accounts for all of those values as well. So what you end up doing is you sketch the Nyquist plot for 
the first half of the frequencies, and then you basically mirror um, what you get about the real axis to get the second half of the Nyquist plot. All frequencies from minus infinity up to zero. Okay, so this is sort of an outline of the first method of sketching a Nyquist plot. Um, we'll do a very brief example based on uh, the Bode plot that we had, one of the first Bode plots that we just looked at. So we have a first order low pass filter, like so, which we already know what the Bode plot looks like. Right? So the magnitude looks like so. Uh, well, actually, let me set set up these axes real quick. So here's your magnitude of P, the phase of P, uh, 1, 0 1, 0 1.1, 0.1, 1, 10, 1, 10. Right, like this. Okay, so we're going to basically transfer this Bode plot over to the S-plane, real imaginary. Okay, so this is our S-plane, and the goal is to get the Bode plot information onto the S-plane. Okay, so the Bode plot itself for this transfer function we know looks something like this. We know it looks something like this, right? Where we have a slope of minus one decade per decade here, the, fa the magnitude starts to roll off at the cutoff frequency of 1, and the phase looks like this. So it starts at 0, ends at negative 90, passing through a frequency of minus, minus 45 at that same cutoff frequency. Okay, so what we're going to try and do is essentially transfer all of this information over to the S-plane. Uh, the key here is to remember that the magnitude of the complex function p of j omega, right? The magnitude represents the distance from the origin, and the phase represents an angle measured from the positive real. Okay, once you understand those two things and recognize that these are just magnitudes and phases um, of a complex valued function p of j omega, then it becomes more clear how to plot it on the Nyquist plot. Okay, so so what the strategy here is to take essentially take a bunch of test frequencies or, or sort of data points, right? So we'll call this A, maybe this is B, and we'll do a few more along the way. Um, for frequency A, which is here and here, we've got a magnitude of essentially 1 and a phase of practically 0. What that means is what that means is, um, actually we'll, we'll keep that here on this color, what that means is on the Nyquist plot a magnitude of 1 is a distance from the origin of about 1, we'll call this 1 right there, and a phase angle of 0. So we're right on, right along the real axis. Okay, So you can put a point there associated with uh, point of interest A. Now at point of interest B you can kind of see here that the magnitude is starting to roll off a little bit. So we have a, a magnitude slightly less than 1, and our phase has rolled off quite a bit. So we're at maybe, we'll call this, say, negative 15 degrees or so, according to our Bode plot. Um, so for point B, we're at a magnitude not quite this far from the origin, slightly less, at a phase angle of minus 15 degrees which is somewhere like here. Right, so there's approximately minus 15 degrees and this distance here, the length of this distance is slightly less than 1. So that's point B. As we take more and more sampled, sampled frequencies here, right, so point of interest C, we have right at the cutoff frequency we have a distance of root 2 over 2, so approximately 0.7 at a phase angle of minus 45. So here's a phase angle of minus 45, but our, our magnitude, right, so if this represents 1 here, we're actually at root 2 over 2, which is somewhere here. So if we were to trace that down, we'd have a point about here. 
So our distance from the origin again, root 2 over 2, at a phase angle of negative 45 degrees. Okay? So you can imagine doing this for several frequencies. Right? Just do this for a whole bunch of frequencies. Um, and by, by the end, you essentially get to play this game of connect the dots to sketch out the Nyquist plot. Okay? But you have to do it for enough frequencies so you don't miss any interesting features of the, the Nyquist plot. Um, okay, so what you can see is as omega approaches infinity, the magnitude of this Bode plot just approaches zero, right? So the magnitude is shrinking, which means that this Nyquist plot is going to end at the origin, right? A distance away from the origin that approaches zero basically means you're approaching the origin. And we're going to approach at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Okay, so let's just, let's pick one more sort of point. We'll call this point D. This has a magnitude even less than before, so we'll call this maybe point three or so, point two or point three, at a phase angle that's pretty close to negative 90. So maybe point D has a phase angle of, say, minus 80 degrees, but our magnitude is very much smaller than C or A or B. Okay, so this is, say, point D right here. Point D forward for all larger frequencies, all that's happening in this region is that the distance is approaching the origin and the phase is approaching minus 90 degrees. So you can imagine this dotted line just sort of swooping over and approaching negative 90 degrees while at the same time the magnitude is getting smaller and smaller. So you can almost trace in this entire range of frequencies like so, just by this sort of swooping line there. Okay. Um, for, for a simple transfer function like this, we have essentially enough information to to sketch in the Bode plot now. Um, what we'll do is we'll basically just uh, we'll, we'll basically connect the dots here. Okay, so from point A to point B to point C to point D all the way up through all positive frequencies up to infinity, we're essentially just tracing out this well, it looks like a semicircle here. Okay? And it's very important to label a few things on your Nyquist plot before you can call it complete. Okay? What I want you guys to label for all your Nyquist plots is four key points. So where is the frequency approximately zero plus? Okay? What this means, zero plus notation means close to zero, but still slightly positive. Okay. Remember that the log scale on the Bode plot, it doesn't have an origin. There's no actual zero point. But as you approach the vertical axis, you're approaching zero from the positive end of the number. So we're going to call that frequency zero plus. And then what's really important is to indicate the direction of increasing frequency. Right. So we start at zero, we go up, 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 up. And then this is the point at which we're approaching positive infinity frequency. Okay, so omega is approaching positive infinity. That's what I need you to indicate. Okay, so two frequencies here in the direction of rotation. Now, remember method one is only going to get you half of the Nyquist plot. We need to mirror about the real axis to get the remaining frequencies. Okay, so once you have the first half of the Nyquist plot, you can go ahead and just mirror about the real axis like so, noting that zero, I'm sorry, minus infinity should map to the same point as positive infinity. And over here, it turns out that uh, zero minus will map to zero plus. And again, we need our direction of increasing frequency, like so, OK? Once you have a closed contour, okay, this is closed contour just means there's no endpoints floating around. Once you have a closed contour and you've labeled all four frequencies and you've indicated the direction of increasing omega, now you have a complete Nyquist plot. Okay, so, so believe it or not, this uh, pink circle in the S-plane gives you the same exact information as the Bode plot does, only it does so in one plot on 
one set of axes rather than a pair of plots as the Bode plots are. Um, we're not going to, I'm not going to explain why we need this yet um, because that's going to come in the next lecture when we introduce the Nyquist stability criterion. I just need you to understand how to basically transfer all the information from the Bode plot onto the S plane. Okay, we'll do one last example of this before we uh, call it a day for this lecture. And the only thing that changes here is the um, sort of difficulty or, or the complexity of the transfer function. Okay, there's nothing different about the process. Um, it's just that the transfer function itself is slightly different. Okay, so let's sketch the Nyquist plot for this transfer function. Okay, we want to sketch the Nyquist plot for this transfer function, and if we're using method one, that requires us to sketch the Bode plot first, right? So that's the whole, that's the only caveat to using method one, is that you actually need a very accurate Bode plot in order to have something to transfer the data from, right? Okay, so uh, how do we sketch the Bode plot for this? Well, we now have a method of doing that, right? If we were to factor if we were to factor this down into a product of two transfer functions, we can see that each one of these transfer functions uh, appears as one of the seven fundamental transfer functions. Okay, so, so just consulting the chart that I gave you, I know what the Bode plot of this looks like, and I know what the Bode plot of that looks like, and through my uh, careful um, uh, depiction of the the um, the axes, right? In other words, if the magnitude is on a log-log scale, if the phase is on a semi-log scale, I can superimpose those graphically. Okay, so we're gonna not gonna review that now uh, because we just did that. But what it boils down to is that we get a pair of Bode plots that look like this. And you have to excuse me, it's going to take a second to get these Bode plots because they actually need to be fairly accurate in order to sketch the Bode plots, uh, in order to sketch the Nyquist plot. Okay. So now that we've got our Bode plots uh, sketched out, um, we can actually start using method one to transfer these values over into the S-plane. Okay, um, so just like before, we'll kind of go frequency by frequency. So way down here when the frequency is low, this always gives us a nice starting point, it's relatively easy. We find that we have a magnitude of one and a phase of zero. Okay, so over here we can uh, you know, from the origin, we're going to go at a distance of one, which we'll call, you know, here. And a phase of zero puts us right on the real axis, so we'll call that point A, right at one. Um, we're going to we're going to sort of move this vertical line little by little until we see things that are interesting. For example, uh, at at this frequency, let's say, I notice that my phase is starting to go a bit positive, so I'm actually greater than zero. And my magnitude is just starting to get larger than one. Right? It hasn't reached this peak, but it's just starting to get larger than one. So what ends up happening is on the Nyquist plot, I'm at a phase angle that's slightly larger than zero. So we'll call this maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 degrees. So 10 or 15 degrees might be here, right? And I'm at a, a, a magnitude slightly larger than A. So it's not here, but it's a little bit further, like so, right? So this would be point B. Okay, then point C, another interesting point is when this phase reaches its sort of maximal positive value. At this value, point C, my magnitude is larger still and my phase is going to be sort of the furthest into this quadrant that it's ever going to get. And we'll call that maybe, oh I don't know, 30 or 40 degrees. So at 30 or 40 degrees, that's as far as I'm going to get out into this quadrant. 
and my magnitude is larger than the magnitude at B. So it's going to be further from the origin than this point, and maybe it's going to be you know somewhere out here. So maybe that's point C. Another interesting point is the phase actually hits some positive maximum, but then drops back down through zero. Okay, this is interesting because this represents another real axis crossing. And at this point, my magnitude is larger still. So at point D, we'll call it, I'm actually at a phase angle of zero, but my distance from the origin is the furthest that it's been thus far. Okay, so this is point D. Um, another interesting point may be sort of when the magnitude hits its largest value. This isn't necessarily that interesting, but this is basically the furthest from the origin that this plot will ever get. So at point E, I'm the furthest away from the origin that I ever will be, but I'm at a phase angle of approximately minus 30 degrees or so. So we'll call this maybe point E out here. So that's the furthest from the origin this Nyquist plot should ever get. Um, <clears throat> another interesting point, probably this one here, when the phase passes through negative 90 degrees. The magnitude's not that important, it looks like it's around one, maybe slightly larger than one, but what's interesting here is that the phase passes through negative 90, which means I'm going to intersect the negative imaginary axis at a magnitude of approximately one. So maybe somewhere around here, call that point F, that's my point F, uh, point of interest. Okay. Another one here is that the phase reaches some minimum value. According to this plot, it's not actually, it never exceeds negative 180, right? So we're not going to actually cross through the negative real axis. This value may be something like negative 120 or so, okay? And at that value, at that phase value, we are starting to now approach the origin. Okay, so my magnitude is a lot less than 1, and my phase angle is like negative 120, somewhere out here. So my my distance from the so if the distance from the origin of a equals one, then right now at point g we're much closer to the origin than that. So maybe like here, like so. Now for all frequencies from g until infinity, my magnitude you can see is just approaching zero. We're just shrinking, shrinking, approaching the origin, and at the same time my phase angle is starting at what appears to be roughly minus 120, and we're just going to smoothly traverse until we hit negative 90. So we're starting at this angle, and we're just sort of smoothly swooping in towards the negative imaginary axis, which is negative 90 degrees. Through that time, the magnitude is going to shrink towards zero, so we get this little bit of the Nyquist plot that represents all frequencies larger than that at point G. Okay. At this point, we pretty much have enough information to um, essentially play connect the dots, right? So we've got point A up through point B through point C, like so, then point E, point F, ultimately connecting with point G and then swooping in towards the origin. And what you're seeing is that, well, Nyquist plots can get very weird, right? They can get very interesting in their shape. Okay, but, but just like with the previous example, we need to show all of our key points. Okay, so we need to show the direction of increasing frequency. We need to show where the frequency is approximately zero plus, so that's here. We need to show the positive infinity frequency. That's at the origin in this case. And again, remember, this only constitutes half of the Nyquist plot, so we actually need to make a plot of all frequencies from minus infinity up through zero minus, oops, up through zero minus, like so. Okay, so again, here we've got the direction of increasing omega, and of course, minus infinity will map to positive infinity, and in this case, again, zero minus maps to zero plus. It's not always going to be the case. We'll handle those cases later, but at this point now, you have a complete Nyquist plot. Okay.
very interesting stuff happens in the S plane as you plot the Bode plot or the frequency response data in the S plane, right? So these Nyquist plots can get very, very interesting, very strange. Uh, so it's important that you understand the concept so that you can trust your process uh, even when you get very strange things in the Nyquist plot. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that for now. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to pick up with a second method to sketch the Nyquist plot, which uh, is arguably quicker, but requires more of a conceptual understanding to execute. Okay, so we'll pick up method two for Nyquist plots, and then finally, we will um, introduce the Nyquist stability criterion, which will allow us to use the Nyquist plot to actually do some controller design. Okay, so we'll see you next time.